Um, so thank you all for coming. Um, this is technically, I guess, our first ACE lunch of the spring semester. Um, and it couldn't come at a more timely moment. Um, I think we are all aware not only of the article and experiences that are being uncovered at Elon, but just in general, how the topic of blackface has just been, I mean, for some of us it's not exploding because it's always been there, but I think for mainstream it's exploding in terms of uh, the number of instances we are seeing past and present, particularly on college campuses. I think even just this weekend, uh, one of the deans of Wake Forest had to apologize. She was on her way to being provost. Maybe she still will be provost for standing in front of the Confederate flag. Um, and in her yearbook pictures, um, and uh, from just a, even a popular culture, I think people remember, uh, I don't know if you remember that, uh, I think, uh, Gucci, and I think there was another uh, um, uh, another fashion um, line that you know included images and and appropriated that kind of menstrual blackface um, uh, uh, character, um, and so we know it, but we don't. Do we really know it? Um, and one of the things that Ace prides itself on is creating a space where we can really critically, consciously, from an academic perspective, as well as a personal perspective, um, uh, learn more uh, about these various different experiences. So I am super excited that our two presenters, facilitators of this discussion today um, are giants um, and people I respect and love dearly, um, but are also um, ACE um, affiliated faculty members uh, and are on um, our, our board and are two of the people why, uh, that I credit as to why this program is growing um, and uh, sustaining. Um, so I'm just really thrilled that I get to sit back and hear them discuss this and educate me, and I'm, I'm excited that you guys are here as well. Um, so th for those of you who don't know, uh, this is Dr. Charles Irons, who's also um, a professor and chair of the history department. Um, Dr. Irons teaches courses on U.S. history, including upper division courses on slavery, the Civil War, and religion. Um, his research is on 19th century, <clears throat> the 19th century South, with a particular emphasis on religious history. Um, I, I knew from when I got here at Elon that Charles was prolific in terms of the work that he has done um, and continues to do through articles, reviews, as well as books. Uh, and he has really been a shepherd in um, steering the Committee on Elon History and Memory, as well as a co-chair for our university studying slavery Elon affiliated uh, committee. Uh, Tyrone Jean is an assistant dean of students and director in the cent uh, for the Center for Race, Ethnicity, and Diversity Education. Uh, prior to Elon, Tyrone has worked as associate director in the Center for Multicultural Affairs at Duke University, interim assistant dean in housing, dining, and residence life at Duke University, program coordinator at University of uh, Virginia, and hall director at, at a residence life at Virginia Tech. Um, he has a Bachelor's of Arts in African American Studies from the University of Virginia. In fact, you, uh, Charles, that the is first your... first points of connection. Yes, <laughs> because Charles, your PhD is from the yes. University of Virginia. And Virginia is an interesting space in which a lot of this is uh, <laughs> <laughs> playing out. <laughs> Not a topic. <laughs> Not a topic. <laughs> in general, the past couple of years, Virginia has just been interesting. Let's put it like that. Uh, and he's received training from the Social Justice Training Institute, Intercultural Development in Inventory, uh, and Racial Equity Institute. Um, he is our other co-chair of the University Setting Slavery uh, at Elon Affiliated Community, and um, many people don't know that I would say co-designer of the Intercultural Competency Program that is at Elon, and hopefully more students will be taking, preferably before they take their yearbook pictures. <laughs> So, without further ado, um, I turn this over to 
And you too. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. well, one of the reasons I'm real uh, to be able to yeah. speak with everyone today and, and, and grateful for Ty's help is I think about the 19th century U.S. and uh, blackface has its kind of origin story in the 19th century U.S. as a, as a widespread cultural practice, um, but it's not just confined to the 19th century. And that translation from understanding blackface uh, as it was practiced and with its social meanings in the 19th century and understanding its persistence uh, and is a little challenge for me. I mean, bringing it into into the present. What's what's continuous and what is discontinuous in the practice and in the meaning. Uh, and so I'm, I really value the chance to have that kind of collaboration. So I am the mainly the 19th century guy. If any of you have listened to the uh, radio show on NPR about American history, this 19th century guy, 20th century guy, I mean. 19th century guys, my advisor, and I adopt that persona. <laughs> um, so we'll, I, I often have students, yesterday afternoon uh, at 3.45, I had a student say, well, there's nothing wrong with blackface anymore. My dad, who's as, as far as you can possibly understand, uh, be from, from racist, dresses up as Diana Ross on Halloween in blackface. Uh, and he just had no like cultural frame uh, that this was a practice that extended m more than 10 years into the past. And this is what I, I hope to sort of provide uh, at the outset a little bit. As we start thinking about the cultural context for blackface, we have one uh, numbersy slide and then almost all images after this. This is just to kind of remind us how turbulent or interesting that the 19th century was, the antebellum period in the US. This is a period of pretty rapid, urbanization, to the percent of urban in 1810, 7.3, up to 20% in 1860. Almost all of that is in the north. Uh, and also it's a period of really robust immigration, although the number uh, in absolute terms was higher in the late uh, 19th century. In per capita terms, we have more immigrants between 1845 and 1855 than at any other point in the nation's history. Uh, so the proportion of the population that was foreign born, no one even bothered to keep track. Uh, until 1850, when there was a period of really intense cultural anxiety about it, and the census started keeping that information. Uh, and we have um, you know 9.7 up to 13.2 percent foreign born by 1860. So the the cultural context for blackface and where it comes out in my courses in the 19th century is this period when immigrants are tending to go to northern cities or to Northwestern territories, but only 15% of the immigrants at most go to the American South. They don't want to compete uh, with slave labor in terms of wages. So everyone goes to the North. Um, there, therefore, there's a huge swell of immigrants uh, from a variety of European backgrounds uh, whose whiteness is contested, which is a key part of the story, right? Are Catholics white? Are Irish folks white? I mean, we understand that whiteness and blackness have great social meaning for constructed identities and how big the fold went, folks hadn't all the way determined. Uh, and so a lot of these immigrants who felt marginalized in any number of ways had a lot of anxiety about their racial identity. And as they got to know the new country, they were wondering, am I going to be counted as an insider or am I going to be counted as an outsider? How is this going to be played? And they could read the tea leaves well enough to know that whiteness was insider, blackness was outsider. And they were in a strange cultural context where and there are less than a quarter million people of African descent in the free states on the eve of the Civil War. Uh, so that is, you know, if there are 21 million people in 1860 in the North, uh, about 230,000 are black, which is a pretty small proportion, right? So you have this situation. All these immigrants, many of them are poor, in cities with racial anxieties, imagining blackness without actual black people uh, around them with them to interact. Um, and sort of additional bits of cultural context that seem important. Uh, this is also the age of the great sort of uh, democratic revolutions in our country. So, I mean, the democratic revolution was a democratic revolution for white people, just to be kind of clear. Jacksonian democracy, um, there Jackson is elected president in 1828 and 1832. Uh, and when he's elected, uh, the franchise expands. Uh, more people are voting, property requirements fall away, and at the same time, black men are prohibited from voting, sometimes explicitly for the first time. Uh, North Carolina, for example, revises its constitution in 1835 to prohibit black men from voting. Uh, so as the franchise expands, uh, the language of popular politics becomes more democratic, 
and black folks are included. So in this period, like, whiteness matters, right? Whiteness matters. There are a lot of folks in the North with, with racial anxieties. And one of the ways that immigrants in the North, uh, particularly in these urban environments, uh, which is where, where blackface really starts, act on their racial anxieties is through the performance of blackness. Uh, and the performance of blackness uh, in blackface, I mean, it's performative in at least two ways, right? Like one way is it's whites imagining a certain kind of blackness and putting it on. Um, but it's performative in the sense that it's also becomes an entertainment uh, that, that, that it's wide cultural currency, very popular. And blackface is quickly mainstreamed uh, as, a, as a cultural performance. Um, one of the first, uh, and most famous, this is not the first, uh, 1830, there had been instances as early as 1800-ish, uh, 18 mid to late 30s, we start seeing it more. It is a professional enterprise by the 1840s. And there are troops that are performing around the country Predom almost exclude not entirely white actors. There are some black actors who participate uh, in the minstrelsy world, uh, but most uh, are, are white actors in blackface masquerading um, in an imagined series of uh, stereotype roles. So you can't read this, and that's fine with me. Uh, but there are down here. This is Christie's Minstrels is one of the most famous, and these songs uh, from their sort of playlist. Uh, that they're, they're listing here. Some of them evoke some of the stereotypes. The Jim Crow polka. Jim Crow is one of the stock characters. Uh, they have a dandy one. Um, where's the? Uh, uh, but there's a, a dandy figure, Zip Coon, uh, who was also there. Was a uh, uh, Miss uh, Lucy Long, a, a kind of sapphire type figure. If you've heard that stereotype, but a, a hypersexualized uh, black woman. Um, and, you, and you see this reflected in this kind of image here. So whites are performing blackness in ways that a lot of cultural currency do cultural work for them. Irish get defined as white, and it's very important. Um, I mean, I think it's just a little bit ironic and interesting. Dixie, the sort of de facto anthem of the Confederacy, is composed in New York City uh, in 1859 for performance by blackface minstrels. Uh, so this is you know, yet another example of um, the, the, the Northern Senate. One of the reasons I wanted to, to mention that is uh, this is composed for, for a specific blackface minstrel troupe in New York City. This is the community, um, this New York City uh, leaning Democratic, capital D, party Democratic, not lowercase d, egalitarian Democratic, um, full of immigrants. Uh, lots of anxieties about whiteness. This is the same group that during the American Civil War will riot uh, after the, I don't know if you've heard of the New York City draft riots, but uh, the federal government, after Gettysburg, needs more troops and the U.S. institutes the draft, the Confederacy had already done it, uh, and white Democrats, primarily Im immigrants in New York City, riot rather than be drafted for a war that has become a war for emancipation. So, and whites just White Democrats, the type who would frequent this, uh, the type who loved Bryant's minstrels, um, demonstrated their displeasure with a war for emancipation by lynching black men and burning, burning black orphanages, destroying black homes and businesses. So that's the intensity of feeling from these white communities who feel like their whiteness is fragile. Um, that, that's the demographic. So as a cultural practice, blackface continues in Hollywood and in other entertainment venues long after slavery. Um, this is a 1927 movie, Al Jolson uh, and the Jazz Singer. It's kind of all about his relationship with, with blackface. Uh, and you, you see some of the um, exaggerated performance of, of, of blackness in this image in, in particular, I think. Um, I do want to start segueing to the Elon context and the kind of things we see. So this world, the world of Al Jolson, the world of performative blackface, the world of blackface is an established uh, cultural tradition, tradition in which whites try on and observe blackness in ways that uh, secure them in their whiteness. Um, we see this in Elon's yearbooks, and we know it happened on Elon's campus. Uh, in a quasi-professional kind of kind of way, 
Um, these are the kinds of images we have from yearbooks from the 1910s through the early 1940s, um, where this is sort of a, I blew up here these, um, I don't have the red dot, sorry. Oh, yes, I do. No, it doesn't magically show on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> what sorry. wizard green is this? <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Sorry, so I, I blew up uh, these images here, but you see that there's a, a performer um, in the context of, of um, the Remember the Night. It's, a, it's campus happenings, campus to-dos. This is not, you know, and blackface and, and blackface. We had a, a, a fair amount of this um, from 1920, uh, an ensemble performance, uh, an entire crew in blackface here. Um, there, there is one kind of uh, image that I, I will tie right when we sat down that there are all kinds of things that I wished I'd thought of yesterday. Um, there are decorations in the yearbooks from 1910s to 1940s that go along with these blackface images. And even though Song of the South is not released until the 1940s, that Disney movie with the kind of caricatured uh, Burr Rabbit type of images and type characters, that motif of cartoon decoration, so no actual images of people, no, no photographs, appears in the margins of yearbooks intermittently from the 1910s to the 1940s. Just as a little sort of, whereas we might call scrolls or leaves or flowers now or something, there are those kind of uh, images that are also in the yearbooks. And then there's sort of a, I mean, these are different, right? Um, we really stopped seeing after the 1940s in the yearbooks images of professional or formal student performances of botanists, and you start seeing these improvisational social fraternity party equivalent or in fact performances of botanists captured uh, and, and, and put in the yearbook. Uh, 1957 here, um, here's one, 1959, and uh, you know, there. this is, um, pulling up from there, just in the fun at Elon page, clowning around is the, is, is the motif. Like this is every bit as performative of blackness. It still is white students acting out their fantasies of blackness and securing their whiteness in the process. Um, it still partakes of the same stereotyped kind of images, but it, it is different in some way from that kind of formal, professional, even paid performer that would come to campus, this kind of thing that we see. Um, I, I put an image on next, which is not of blackface, but is an image of a man. Um, I, uh, Crystal Carpenter in archives made the identification. Um, I have, but it seems like it, uh, it links these two periods and it demonstrates some of the kinds of continuities. Uh, it is a deeply insulting image of an Elon staff member. Uh, and it seems to just to indicate that whatever might have changed are real continuities in the ways that whites are imagining and stereotyping blackness during this period. So this is um, not a performer, this is a, a, a staff member. Um, and again, I have to rely on Crystal Carpenter for that attribution. This is the 1936 yearbook where this man, the staff member, is la labeled Elon Stusky Midget. Uh, and, and this is the kind of thing that to me is like, feels even you know, everybody's horrible, some of the blackface stuff we're seeing, um, <coughs> even worse, but it's not a part of the conversation, right? Um, and then this is the same man, uh, we believe, uh, 20 odd years later, uh, labeled only his first name, and of course, every white person in the yearbook has their title and first and last name uh, with no quotation marks. Um, yeah. Can I interrupt you? Is this the same man that's the shirt in the library? Yeah, I was wondering that same thing. I'd love to see that to be sure. I don't yeah, know. portrait. You go into teaching learning, and it's I, mm -hmm. I, 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 my stomach turns a little bit okay. every time I see that portrait because okay. it echoes that. Okay. Yeah. There yeah. are a couple yeah. of incidents. I mean, there's one time that we could have done the whole thing. Around. There's one um, staff person who passes away a little later than this, actually, and mm -hmm. whites to commemorate the death make a play in which they perform in blackface. Uh, 
you know, so there, and we don't have the same kind of visual yeah. documentation yeah. of it here. It's not a part yeah. of the yearbook conversation. But Walk through the library. I'm not yeah. sure what his name is. I feel like it could be the same person. That is an um, Ethan Morgan by the because those portraits are all cataloged. Great. And I think there's a name underneath it, so I'm just like, Sorry. No. So I do want to hand it off to Ty to start transitioning even more to the to the present. Um, but those are the kinds of things that gave blackface initial cultural momentum and the kinds of records that we are finding when we look through it. All the yearbooks are online except the last six or seven years. You, you can browse through them all yourself. Uh, and there is more out there, certainly, than, than it is on there. So obviously our, our history is a, a lot more complex than we would want it to be, right? That's, that's the lived reality of it. Um, and it's fascinating, or not fascinating, it's ironic that the ways in which we have conversations <coughs> around blackface still centers whiteness and white people, <laughs> right? And so even along this time from the 1850s into um, the 1910s, uh, 20s, 30s, and 40s, black people are performing in blackface. And that narrative is often untold, right? And so I want to read, a, I want to read you a, a quote from Burt Williams, who was one of the pioneers um, of black's face and minstrelsy. And he was asked a question about um, why he performs blackface. I quote, a black face, run down shoes, an elbow out of makeup, give me a place to hide. The real Burt Williams is crouched deep down inside the coon who sings the song and tells the stories. Right? Mm -hmm. So imagine at his, in his context, being a black person and not being able to have the authority mm -hmm. to, the, the authority, the, the ownership and the power to even represent himself. He has to put on mm -hmm. something that he is not to perform for white people so that they are, so that he is socially acceptable. Right? Um, you see the, throughout history, you see the emergence of all of these um, different uh, minstrel characters, you know, um, Charles referenced several of them. You have uh, Sambo, you have Lucy Long, you have Buckwheat, you have all of these characters. And when you get to the heart of why did they perform this, right? If black people did it, it's okay, right? But you have to understand that it was a form of survival, right? And the parallels in which black people today are still trying to survive in society. Um, and so we, I have to complicate the history and the narratives that get told around blackface as we sort of transition into contemporary times. Um, so one of the things I wanted to do was I did a quick Google search as we talk about blackface in, a, uh, uh, in contemporary times and specifically on college campuses. So I'm going to show you some images. Um, and then it's going to also articulate the ways in which blackface has evolved over time. Um, I learned a new term that I'll share with you at sort of at the end of the, the uh, photographs um, about how blackface is continuing to evolve um, in modern times. So rappers, 2012, University of Florida. Duke University, Buckwheat, 2012. Jackson 5. Whitworth University, 2014. Albright College, 2016. Bill Cosby, Central Arkansas University, 2016. Terry Crews, Wheaton College, 2017. Colin Kaepernick, Dickinson College, 2017. If you look at this image, he has a gun pointed to his head. Charles Sturt University in Australia, 2018. One of the reasons I included this image from Australia, I primarily focused on institutions of higher education in the US. But if you go outside of the US, you'll find a lot of blackface depicted, and it's global, right? And I specifically focuses on colleges. Now, if you go to the high school level, if you go into the workplace, mm -hmm. there's multiple images of blackface and people performing blackface. Mm -hmm. Elon University, 2018, Nicki Minaj. 
So the question that, that we then want to pose, does blackface have a current space on college campuses today? The answer is a resounding yes, right? And so the next photo I want to show is sort of the, the ways in which blackface is, blackface is now uh, evolving. This term, black fishing, um, uh, Ariana Grande, mm -hmm. Grande um, in which people, white people, are darkening their skin, applying makeup, adding accessories to their bodies to perform what their ideas of blackness are. It's called black fishing. I just learned that term relatively recently. Here's another photo. This is the original picture, and these are sort of the outcomes. All right. So a lot of imagery that, that tells us that blackface is relevant to today. Um, and so I wanted to just begin our conversation about blackface and helping us deconstruct um, sort of what we know. So I wanted to jump in to some of the questions. Um, and so is, black, is, black, is blackface only a thing of the past? And if it's not, what role does it play on college campuses? What is y'all's perspective on it? What role does blackface play on college campuses today from your perspective? I'll start off by, you know, just in my interactions with students, asking them, you know, how does blackface impact you, right? And students, and this, this demonstrates to me the evolution of blackface, when students say, you know, it's kind of like a historical thing, it's something of the past, we know students of today wouldn't do it. Obviously, it's not true, right? Um, but it also brings, students will then reference parties with names like Bad and Bougie, or, you know, uh, parties that have rap themes to them. Right? So the ways in which uh, this, this blackface has evolved over time is, is how I see it show up in the ways in which students share narratives with me about their experiences. You know, as both you and uh, Charles made a very I was just judging those stuff, asking why, what's, why are we, what, what, what's blackface, and is it just entertainment? Or is it a kind of packaging, commodifying of black bodies on terms of whiteness? And that's one of the things that, you know, I mean, it's kind of a reframing then of black bodies. We're always reframing, controlling, packaging, repackaging black bodies on the terms of whiteness. Would that be for entertainment value? Would it be for uh, commodification value or control? I mean, that's exactly how I understand it. Just to all my everything that you just said, the the control and packaging of black bodies. That's everything that I understand, uh -huh. and that. I think accommodates the range of images that you see from the contemporary scene. Uh -huh. I mean, the, there's one portion of images that you see which is like explicitly about race, power, and violence. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're the Klan images and the lynching images. You see folks with um, with nooses. Uh, and that is, is clearly about power and control, uh -huh. but it's just as much about commodification and consumption even mm -hmm. of, of, of black bodies and, and imagined or typed black culture when you see the, um, I mean, the other big genres are, are performers, mm -hmm. uh, which whites feel entitled to, to yeah. create in a certain way. Yeah. So everything you said it just seems like that's exactly how I understand it. Well, which is why I don't think we should at all let like students often think, oh, it's just entertainment or this kind of, you know, we didn't know the what it's part of context, or it was meant to be harmful, but it is harmful. It is a kind of violent, controlling thing that runs very deep. And it also serves as a reminder, of course, mm -hmm. to this day, that black people, you still don't have power over self. Right. You still don't have control over self. Mm -hmm. um, which is, it, it brings to, the, to, 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 to my point, or one of my points is that the ways in which we continue to have conversations around blackface, it, it, it always centers whiteness. We never ask about what, how are black students feeling as a result of the blackface. Um, and, I, and I have to introduce that narrative to the conversation because I just don't see it happening in really great ways. Um, Tanihisi Coates um, once um, was giving a, a lecture about a book um, that he had recently written and somebody asked him a question about why can't white people use the N-word? Mm -hmm. 
And his response, I think it was prophetic and it's relevant to blackface. And he articulated this, I'm not, I'm, not, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, mm -hmm. but he articulated the idea that white people are born to feel as though they have access to everything mm -hmm. and have ownership and power over everything, even black people's identity. Mm -hmm. And so they feel as though they need, they, they have power, they have control in order to put that cork uh, you know, uh, face paint on or body paint, what have you. Yeah, question. I was going to say, um, how are the, um, the black students here at Elon kind of responding to, to this? Are, are some, you know, saying they don't see it as such a big deal? Or, I mean, what's the kind of general consensus? Student, when it, when it happens on campus, it is a big buzz mm -hmm. among students. They have, um, you know, students communicate in very different ways. Mm -hmm. They have a, a group called the V's, um, where it's uh, black students con uh, communicating with each other. And if something like this happens, when, when it happened last year, uh, this past Halloween with Nicki Minaj, it was all over. I mean, it spills into folks talking about it in the creed, and they're very upset. Um, and students, unfortunately, have learned how to become desensitized yeah. to, to this. And, you know, I always, worry about the cognitive space that this, this takes up for black students in particular. <laughs> when they're in the classroom, they have to worry about this. Um, it comes out when they say, you know, the creed and the GLC are the only spaces on campus. You know, we have 2.7 million uh, um, uh, cubic acres on this campus. And they're talking to about two spaces where they feel that they can be their, their selves and, and feel appreciated. That, that, that is something I think about regularly. So they're, they're, they're absolutely impacted by it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I really like what you said about this being about the performance of, of, of whiteness. This might, and uh, the, another Coates riff, um, Coates had that essay about Donald Trump being the first white president mm -hmm. because he's, he's, he's so self-consciously white. And, so, right. mm -hmm. and uh, the two folks that I follow the most, um, Eric Lott and Dave Roeger, I wrote about blackface 20 years ago. And these are still the books to which everyone who's publishing today mm -hmm. refers. Um, and uh, Rodiger points out that blackface performers were the first self-consciously white performers. Mm -hmm. Is they're performing mm -hmm. as a white person, mm -hmm. to be white person, and to dramatize their whiteness. Mm -hmm. um, that no other performer in their world was self-consciously and explicitly white as a part of what this was a way to dramatize their whiteness. Mm -hmm. So I don't really know what to do with this piece of information, but it, when, it makes me, I've been thinking about it a lot. So 20 years ago, when I started teaching, <laughs> that made me feel old. Um, I had a student at Furman, I used to have Furman before I came to Elon, and I had a student there, um, an art student who was black, and she, in her senior year, made a series of photographs of herself in blackface that she had her white friends apply intentionally because she said in her senior year at Furman, which I imagine is not that different for students um, here, she's like, all of a sudden I realized I was black and all of a sudden I realized that I had not been allowed or afforded the same sort of access to my identity that my <coughs> colleagues had. So she made this really powerful series of photographs. And I mention that only because she, that she's been in the back of my mind for the last few weeks because she's an adult now, like living in the world somewhere, and I don't know what's happened. Um, but also because she found she found a space and a voice to sort of think about that. But that was 20 years ago. <laughs> that was 20 years ago, or okay, let's. I made myself too old. Like 18 years ago, and I and I. When you're talking about our students here, I can imagine that it's not that that they're having some of those same same thoughts and. I don't know, she, she exhibited it in the senior show and you know, people saw it and probably walked around just right to the next thing. But she absolutely like, learned that that was one of the only ways she could present herself in that landscape. Mm -hmm. so I, just that. I have an observation to share. So I teach uh, at the business school and I often you know, teach about ethics and social responsibility. So there's a there's a photograph that I I actually you know picked up uh, when I was uh, you know trying to prepare for one of my lectures, and it shows uh, you know there are two images uh, newspaper clippings I have from uh, Hurricane Katrina 2005, mm -hmm. and there's this uh, you know white family and they have a you know, bunch of supplies in there like eggs and bread, and the 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 news the news I mean, the journalist explains that white family or not they don't point out race but they say a family 
trying to securing some supplies from a store and trying to survive. And then there's another image of a, of a, of a black kid and who's again wading through a chest deep water. He has the same supplies and the word is looting a store. So again, that's you know a relativism you know, in terms of you know just by the by you know, changing the skin color how it changes the impressions of you know journalism. So that's a photograph. You know, I like I love to share it with you. So that's something that you know comes to my mind also in comparison. You know, the same act happening in the same space and how it's being viewed and perceived. Just the obvious difference is the skin color. And then to answer your question that you asked earlier, you know, how do how do I feel when I see uh, an African American student or a black student in my class? I think a sense of relief you know, for me that uh, that there is you know some kind of a diversity or there is some uh, you know uh, you know diversity. And for that matter, you know if I see an Indian or Asian student or you know uh, uh, a Hispanic origin student, so I, I feel a sense of relief in the sense that now we can have you know perspective because I often talk about uh, affirmative action and I often talk about. You know, you could have bombed opportunity you know, in my HR you know, related topics. And I often get a very one sided view, but when I have this other side, you know, and I ask them, I mean, it's very hard for them to openly you know, uh, communicate their ideas, but, but it's, uh, it's a sense of relief that you know, at least both sides you know, can talk about. So. Well, I mean, just to gently say, we can't also, talking about performing blackness, we can't ever put our students on the spot and ask them to perform a black response to a question. Right. right. I mean, it's a because that is not fair in the same way. Right. Well. Right. I mean, I'm, I'm not. Right. I didn't mean it that way. Right. I'm just. I'm just thinking that you know, I have a certain scenarios, you know, which I present to my students, you know, like a shackled man scenario, and then I tell them, you know, how do you feel about this player who's been in, you know, unjustly in jail for a few years, and now he's asked to run a marathon, you know, and there's the other player, you know, is is being able-bodied and he's been preparing. And then I kind of you know divert you know to the topic of you know what's being done, and then ask their views. You know, I, it's it's not you know putting somebody you know in the spotlight or anything. It's just a general opinion. And uh, if there is diversity in class, you know, it's a, it's a very well-rounded discussion. That's, that's all. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I think one of the places that we don't think about when we're talking about. Um, the implications of blackface on campus is what does that mean for the black faculty member, for the faculty member of color? Um, because, you know, we'd like to say that it doesn't affect, but as a psychologist, I know that it does. I mean, just how we present ourselves in the front of the classroom automatically goes into our spot evaluations or any evaluations. I mean, I've had students comment about my clothes. Now, my clothes are. Fabulous. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> I I but, <laughs> but I just remember having a conversation. I was, it was like late at night. My husband was in bed and the lights were all on, and I was going through like several different outfits. And he was like, Why are you doing this? Just pick something and go to bed. And I was like, Thanks, white man. And, you know, he just was like, I like that other outfit. Um, <laughs> but it was in this moment that he is a teacher, just he doesn't have to perform, you know, it when he gets to the front of the classroom. And you think about the fact that I'm very conscious of the fact that on a Monday or a Tuesday or a Friday, things start kind of Wednesday or Thursday, you could have had a student who was out at one of these parties engaging in this way. And then now they're sitting in my classroom and here I am, this black body in front of them, and I have to convince them that I have this level of expertise and I'm doing that not only as a, a, a black person, I'm doing that as a woman, I'm doing that intersectionally as a black woman. Um, and you know, you just think of how the hurdle that some of us have to climb, considering just at a on a, on a, on a at least on a subconscious, if not conscious level, the expressions of blackface are really the expressions of where they're seeing. The, the ways they view and, and look at black bodies, that their characters, they're not to be taken seriously, right? And that comes out in our evaluations, right? I, I health psychology, I have several articles, you know? I mean, I'm not a genius, but like, I'm pretty good at what I do. And I've been teaching this class since I landed here in 2010. And when I'm presenting stats and presenting them from the CDC and the World Health Organization, clearly labeled, and yet I have students writing, well, I just, 
I just feel her stats must be wrong, right? Because it doesn't go in the direction that they want it to go in. But the fact that they can write that, right, is this automatic assumption that you as a black woman, really, what do you know? I'm probably at your level, if not higher. And that's not every student. But I think that it aligns with this discussion of it goes into this discussion, right? And the and the, what they what is expected of the black body? What are the limitations of the black body, even on an intellectual level? And I think it also goes into the discussion when you talk about power and you talk about mm -hmm. um, how whiteness historically uses history to exonerate the present from the past. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. you go back to slavery and they're like, at least you're not a savage in Africa. And you go to Jim Crow era and it's like, at least you're not a slave. You go to prison, it's like, at least you're not in the civil rights era where, mm -hmm. or, or Jim Crow era, um, when you're not. And it's this, the sense of power and having the power over perception and uh, how to define what is right and what is wrong, what's racist and what's not. and. Um, how blackface, like what blackface is and how, or like even now blackfishing is like, oh, we're gonna distort it a little bit more and we're gonna say, oh, I'm not in blackface, I'm just taking on what I feel is beautiful, but what is beautiful and what is like appropriate. And who um, gets to define And who gets to define that and what, and like how do, how are they making money off of it and like how is the commodification of blackness still being exploited today and who who's creating those definitions and how does it impact us? And why do we still have to continue to um, to basically put out our our like credibility on the line and have to continue to reinforce, like just continue to have to fight um, over time and get reset back to zero? Yeah, I mean to pick up on Buffy's point and your point, Alonzo, so that you know as in the, in the academy, right, it's like faculty that you are on the scaffold every time you walk in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And the scaffold, you're under the gaze of not only white students, or, but students of color, right? And students mm -hmm. of color have perceptions of, of you, so do uh, uh, white students. And you are tasked with putting on a performance mm -hmm. to shatter those narratives, right? Mm -hmm. The black face narratives for both white and non-white uh, students. And it does have a psychological it's impact. And like when you're doing it like, okay, that happened to you. Mm -hmm. uh, you try to unpack what just happened and then you get ready again for the next performance. It, 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 I'm very aware <coughs> of my performative self in the, in the classroom uh, space. Mm -hmm. And in my first two years looking at my spots, I, I will say I've had relatively good spots, I would say that. I don't know if it's something to do with my, there's a whole different thing about my genetic and accent. It gives mm -hmm. me a different layer. We can talk about that uh, some other time. But I've seen words like, oh, he's so cool, he's so funny. I'm like, what about the stuff I'm saying? And then, it, you know, it, it took, uh, it was in my third year when I said, oh, he's in, in, intelligent, he knows his stuff, but it was always, this cool guy, so nice. Mm -hmm. Which, mm -hmm. off the cuff, it seems like, okay, that's fine. But then me and my unpacking self, I'm like, what does the word, is the word cool, another cool word for something else? Mm -hmm. It might not be, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm, in other words, I'm trying to put you in the mind of the black body who is a performer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Every mm -hmm. single time I go in front of the classroom um, is a performer when Elon asks you to do something like, okay, I have to put out a show because you're on the scaffold again. Mm -hmm. It's very performative to take Patricia, Patricia Phil Collins and the performative self, you know? Mm -hmm. I think Buffy uh, and, and Damien, you bring up really good parallels, which is one of the questions that we wanted to discuss as, you know, from a historical perspective to contemporary times, what are the parallels from blackface to your experiences now, mm -hmm. right? What you're articulating um, may, uh, the result of it may be stereotype threat. The result of it may be imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. Um, and our students certainly articulate this, and I would imagine that our faculty and staff have these similar experiences and feelings um, because of the performative nature of um, their roles. Um, so are there other parallels that you all see between historical analysis of blackface to 
contemporary times, other parallels. I actually have a question, and I'm not sure if that is going too far or if you had a chance to look into that. Um, as a Europeanist myself, I was wondering, you briefly mentioned that outside of the U.S., college campuses are also experiencing or dealing, addressing this phenomenon. Like, what do, do we have any insight? Like, I don't think that there is a similar discussion, like it has started in the U.S. about blackface happening in European countries right now or in Australia. I'm not aware of it. And what I find interesting and what is brought up by some of the questions that you raise is also that there are like so many aspects of American history that play into that about the structures of how racism is rooted in this country. So if you look at Germany, Nazi Germany, the racism mainly is white on white. So it would be really interesting to think about like what does blackface mean? Are there the same um, aspects that play into that? How is that perceived? And therefore I was just curious like, have you been able to trace, and like in France or other European countries, we're seeing similar phenomena, right? Like, if that impacts the discussion, if that impacts it, because I think there, it could also be important to translate that, right, and share some of the insights and information we have here about this to make others aware who might not have that perspective. Mm -hmm. um, I certainly believe that while race may be a factor globally, Right, it may be an evolved, it evolved from colonialism. And so depicting other as other and performing that in, in, a, different, in a different vein. Um, and so I definitely believe that race is a part of it, but I think once you start going outside of the US, race is socially constructed in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, there's similarities, but there's also different ways in which people have operationalized race um, in a global context. I'm really stuck on some of Damien's language about commodification and control and the resulting performative dilemmas for black faculty, staff, and students. And uh, the language that you used reminded me of all these other cultural resonances from the 19th century that have to do with race. So the same period that their whites are performing blackness and blackface, they're commodifying black bodies in other ways beyond the obvious enslavement and sale. But the, this is when uh, American colleges and universities and the brand new Smithsonian are, are collecting indigenous and black bodies and cataloging them and, and sorting them and, and uh, accumulating them you know, as objects. Um, I just finished um, at Ebony and Ivy and uh, in the horrible chapter that is this parallel moment in American history, I have even the... Um, in the, the black biology faculty uh, in, in this emerging discipline are displaying in their offices black body parts and black bodies. Uh -huh. um, but it, it is such commodification and control, and it creates I, such a dilemma. And, and your point tags on back to your question about the, the American episode of this and the international episode. And this come, came out of a discussion we had on campus. We invited a speaker from Duke. I'm forgetting his name right now, talking about whiteness. I was John Lewin. Yeah, John Lewin. I was the reference of oh, I forget his name. <laughs> but the, the, the American context has the institutionalized uh, ways in which race and racism has been a part of its whole body politic. It has also been the very geography and site of the institution of, of, of enslavement, which is quite this similar to that in the European context. It, those were the sites of the very institution of uh, enslavement. And so there's a unique American strand to blackface, to racism, to white supremacy. Um, both are awful, but there's a unique American uh, flavor to it. Again, the historical wormhole has gone through the institutionalized uh, ways in which uh, it is very much embedded, mm -hmm. I have been saying, in, in America's whole mm -hmm. body politic, and it's part of the birth of the nation, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We were, mm -hmm. the nation was birthed out of that yeah. Um I was just thinking about what you were saying about blackface as a, as a, in the 19th century for white performers as a way of performing whiteness. And then this kind of goes back to your earlier question too about students on campus and 
I think with my white students, often when I talk about race in the class, white students initially feel like that doesn't have to do with them because they don't understand themselves as racialized. They don't have language to talk about whiteness. And I, I think when we've talked about ideas like parties, like gangster parties or mm -hmm. rap parties or the stuff, it feels to me like white students are almost, maybe not always, but sometimes that's like a transgressive space to try to perform whiteness and think about whiteness when there are not a lot of other spaces for them to like talk about or like unpack whiteness. Does that make sense at all? It makes sense. I mean, I, I want to complicate a little sure, bit. Yeah. I, I think that, you know, white students view whiteness, whether it's unconscious or subconscious or conscious, as the norm. Yeah, and so yeah, therefore yeah. they don't Yes. They don't feel as though it, it's a necessity to mm -hmm. explore. Mm -hmm. It's a necessity to engage. Mm -hmm. And you know, when we in the creed working in, in there, when I when I get to engage white students and they're encountering their whiteness for the first time because a friend said something to them or they attended one of these racist parties and are 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 just negotiating like what what does this mean and not what does it mean for student what does it mean for me as a white person how how do I shed this this white supremacy notion off of my body and wash clean of it. And my question is, can you, right? How, how, do you, how do you exist within white supremacy institutions that are so pervasive, so insidious in nature, and so ever evolving? I guess I was thinking about a particular video that students made in class where there were um, white students and black students who were on a team were interviewing their teammates about race. And it was very interesting that, and then we talked about it afterwards, and that the, they felt like the answers they were getting were not accurate because they knew this was going to be shown in a classroom. Mm -hmm. And so there's this way in which like, there was this subtext that like, what they were talking about, that they would never like, go to a party that was like, they, they would never do these things, that they were, there was this idea that no, they would, but they knew that it was like, inappropriate to admit that they would do this stuff. Which I think is just an interesting space that like you would do it even though you know that you shouldn't do it. I think that's the power that yeah. that's yeah, the yeah. power piece that I keep coming back to like the that one um, photograph that you showed um, with the to the white kid in the not tied tie next to the kid in blackface, like the that sort of sort of yeah. typical frat boy presentation or white frat boy presentation and and the and the power um of the posture um and i in, in thinking i'm thinking i'm thinking about virginia i know you'll tell me not to but um <laughs> but i think one of the if, if we think about sort of the white supremacist institution of higher education and we think about the way that there are certain vestiges of it that um we know are problematic, but we can't talk about. Um, and just the power, the power in knowing that something like some of these parties are absolutely not what they are supposed to say in class, but go going yes. to them and perf and not performing or yes performing or like claiming that power. Yes. Like that is the piece that sounds like now and we're and 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 people are surprised that this is what is happening at the highest levels of government and you're like are you because it's the same kind of that, that's the piece that i just it's like sitting it's like sitting in, in me and i don't quite know what to do with it but like that's the piece that i feel like the most insidious part and it's always been there it's been there it's like it's the it's that yeah mm -hmm. I think it might be potentially even right that they're also enjoying the participation yes. in it, but like then feel like, oh, but I shouldn't talk about that. And that is kind of like Or I can't because where where sometimes it is like this this notion of what is politically correct and I learned how to behave in that space, but that is not necessarily identical with the values that I have or the experiences that I seek out. So like kind of like there there is the language in the classroom and I know that needs to be addressed here, but like there is my actual life, and I do something different and engage differently. As to your, as to your point, that and I'm not saying everyone does that, right? Like, mm -hmm. But 
As a point, Buffy Ford did me a great article that um, Jim Crow and Fraternity Row, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, and it makes precisely this point that you're making that um, the classroom for some white students, and it's, I mean, it doesn't feel like a safe space to explore their whiteness, but fraternities yes. mm -hmm. are yes. on right. You can. Yeah. And then again, just explore their whiteness all they want. Yeah. Um, so it's an exploration of that dynamic. Yes. But, and, and on this point of, of whiteness and looking at the, the, your white self in the mirror, and I'm going back to a pedagogical thing here. So I do study abroad and we take students to Barbados, right? Mm -hmm. It's a real course, we don't just go to the beach. <laughs> and so this year we had 22 students, one uh, black identified student, and the rest of the students are white identified here. And so we make them journal. And so the students say, wow, for the first time in my life, I'm in a space where I'm not in the majority. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's just what the white students are journaling about, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and I'm noticing, I'm reading stuff, and they're talking about it, the way it makes them feel, mm -hmm. but the people are nice. And towards the end, we ask them to journal again when you're on the plane after you've left, you know, talk about mm -hmm. And quite a few students said, oh, I'm so happy to go back home to my space where I'm more comfortable, mm -hmm. right? So they get to confront their white self in a place where they're not, uh, it's not their comfort zone, right? Mm -hmm. They're not the majority. And so I think the, the part of the teaching, learning, intercultural process, because at the end one is how do we have to fix this stuff, is putting a mirror. I don't know how we're going to put that mirror in front of, and I think we should make distinctions between whiteness, which is this very visceral, uh, power-laden uh, thing, and, and white self. I think there are two things. And when we talk about whiteness, it's easy. Because people can say, oh, I'm not that. I'm not the white person. I'm not that stuff. But then what about the less extreme versions of that? And I think that we need to always have that mirror there, um, especially in the, base, in the academia in the classroom space mm -hmm. so that they can uh, confront it, they can identify it and pose questions at uh, the white self-awareness. I think that's key and, it, and it's, it's hard to find that experience. I, I, I think it was last year, two years ago, I went to a, it was the Black Student Union perhaps was doing an event, My Black is Strong, they had t-shirts. Mm -hmm. One of my students workers was presenting, so I went to see his thing. I walked in, realized oh, I'm the only white guy in here. So that was cool. Somebody asked me to sit at the table and that student after student, to speak to your earlier comment, were standing up and describing the moment when they understood their blackness. Like some some they were a very young child and they the day that they realized they were black, up to that point they were what they were. I mean they recognized the color of their skin, but and for some it was as early as as recent as when they got the Elon and and before they they sort of confronted their blackness and we I had a similar experience where I was like the only white guy on my crew when I worked in Guam I was like very weird you know felt very strange but so many of us our students they've never had that chance and I, I actually experienced being the only person of color with a group of white students going to the Dominican Republic last 2018. And it's not just the, oh, they want to go back to their space, but while they're there, they're taking advantage of black spaces. Mm -hmm. So taking advantage of, like, the one line that sticks in my head is with the, like, one of, my, one of the, uh, the students said, the Dominican Republic has no rules. And they consistently lived in that privilege. And it goes back to the conversation we were having last night with some of the students talking about whiteness. And the one thing that's sticking in my head is can white privilege exist outside of white supremacy culture? Because I feel as though there's this notion that whiteness, like white people and, and white folks can, ha can have and have white privilege <coughs> unknowingly, mm -hmm. but not um, not, what is the word, not like not support white supremacy culture. Mm -hmm. And I was struggling with that because I feel as though there are a lot of students who exist within that paradigm that they can, they can have white privilege and try to counteract the, the 
all the privileges that they have without being a part and supporting white supremacy culture. And I don't think that that can, ha that can exist. So I suppose it, it, it's because this is a uh, talk and a presentation about yearbooks. Um, but I'm struck about, I'm struck by the ways that we're talking uh, exclusively about students here in this conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and now it's the end of our time and so forth, but I wonder what a conversation about faculty would mm -hmm. be like, or a conversation about administration. And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the language of our pursuit of excellence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right, so university culture at large. Mm -hmm. Is, is that something that you were able to trace? Like in your book, sometimes there are also pictures from faculty or administrators, right? Like is there some notion that you got or also in the work of Elon History and Memory we're, we're starting to look more USS, uh, the committee, into these things? Maybe to, to give like the link to something in the future that we could explore or should discuss or think about? I mean, maybe just one more sad note on which to <laughs> I think the, the, the overwhelming sense that, that this is another version of this packaged, controlled, commodified uh, narrative that I feel like I experienced. There's a, um, I had students look at the uh, Durwood Stokes account of desegregation here. It's the old history of Elon, and then the Troxler new one. And the old one, you know, it's. Uh, when Phillips came and poor girl, she got sick, but she had a great time while she was here. Uh, and then 147 other black students came, and it's just been great. We don't have any problems like we did in other places. And then moving on to the Troxler account, um, on the one hand, it was better, kind of, you know, acknowledged, well, whether it was apparently you know, really unhappy and did not leave just because of illness and life is complicated, mm -hmm. but it's framed from the beginning. It starts with Danielly reaching out and not paying any attention to what Clinton Phillips might have wanted, but saying he just calls a high school and says, give me your best black student. Uh, and that's the opening of this account. <laughs> and then the end of the account is, we realized that there were problems, but we, we called the governor when we realized there were problems. And, uh, and the governor got on the case because that's what we do. But it's packaged around you know, administrative responsiveness and performance. Mm -hmm. But it, it, yeah. of course, it's not actually the paying attention to the men and women who were involved in the story. Um, yeah. But so that, when I think about administrative responses, that's what I think. Mm -hmm. That kind of tightness of control, which mm -hmm. continues some of the patterns of performing whiteness uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and prescribing exactly what blackness can be or should be. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's a continuity there. I think we're in that moment. I mean, I think you bring up a very timely point is that we're in that moment now as we look back at our history, when we uncover things, what, what are the ways in which we're going to respond? Um, you know, if you've been paying attention to the news happening at Wake Forest, they have a, um, a soon-to-be provost who was seen in a photo um, with some fraternity members um, with a large Confederate flag, and students calling for the, the person's resignation, and the person's role at the institution has been to recruit um, students with minoritized backgrounds for the past several years. So how, how do we negotiate that? And I think, you know, from a faculty and staff perspective as well as administration, that this, this is the crossroads we're currently at, and we have to figure that out. And I think this form is probably the, a beginning to that conversation, um, but certainly not the end to the conversation. Yeah. As we continue, oh, 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 oh. I'm just saying that this is part of the, I think the disentangling process of all these things, and, you know, it's very, it's very deep, it's very complex. It's interwoven in the very uh, socio-economic and political fabric of our society. And as we begin to disentangle this stuff, it's going to be very uncomfortable. Yeah. And you're going to see that. You're going to see people who were before a Confederate flag, but they, the one their role was to recruit. Because it's so, it's an interwoven, very, uh, muy complicado, the Spanish would say. And even the classroom space, you know, you know, I, I developed the Batman America class and teaching that course and even the core 110, it, 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 you're going through these very um, 
actually trenches, right? But it, it has to be done, but it's not an easy, this disentanglement process is uncomfortable. That's the point. It's very uncomfortable, mm -hmm. but it's necessary. And it's again framed also by power structures, right? Like who mm -hmm. is involved in which ways mm -hmm. and who has the power over the narratives then mm -hmm. also. Yeah. I've been having this thought um, recently, I think even just reflecting on my own work and what does that mean in terms of my own career. Um, and someday I'll write an article called Black Boots on the Ground, right? There's a lot you can read in that. But this notion that, particularly when we're talking about work around diversity, work around disentangling these issues, that oftentimes the persons that are, are doing it are the persons that are, are largely yeah, <laughs> affected by it themselves, mm -hmm. one, but also it's dirty work, right? Yeah. Disentangling this is dirty work. And so I just keep having this image of in doing this work, kind of being part of this group that's the architect, that's the actual builders of whatever this new framework would be and how you have to get your hands dirty. And this nagging feeling that once it's built though, someone's gonna tell me I can't come in because my hands are dirty. Mm -hmm. Like that's been this nagging mm -hmm. visual mm -hmm. image that I've been driving home with mm -hmm. as you know, mm -hmm. we start USS work as I think about the work that I do in all these places and how we're getting to a point as a society where you're not going to be able to hide. And this is going to be expected that you're going to be doing some of this work. And I think that there is an understanding that, yes, we'll allow some people to do this work. And in doing that work, it'll get you dirty. I'm not exactly sure that that means that they're going to let me in mm -hmm. once it's built. Mm -hmm. And that's another implication mm -hmm. of blackface. Mm -hmm. What would it look like if we had a question about messiness and discomfort and uh, negative reviews on your teaching evaluations? <laughs> like, what would it look like if that was a marker of, of success? success? Yeah. Yeah. Well, then the question that you're even having to ask that there is a they that would somehow, like, that you've created this structure that there's an inherent power structure that exists within this new thing you've created that would then mm -hmm. further marginalize mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. The most honest statement. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. And how deep it goes. Ooh, I know. Yeah. All right. I'm good. I know. 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 I there is a space. I'm grateful for a little Nina boy who fought for an academic space. So conversations like this can happen. I'm 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 grateful grateful for a Prudus Lane Prudus Lane Lane that fought for an actual physical space um, because you know they are. The conversations are needed. The space to have those mm -hmm. conversations are needed. I do believe in the power of counter narratives and counter spaces. Mm -hmm. uh, and you and the more people that will fill it, the better. We're cozy in here, but it's a good cozy. Mm -hmm. And I still feel the sun shine. <laughs> Hard conversations, but I still feel the sun. Thank you all for coming. Thank and you. Look out. I'm sure we will have more to come. Mm -hmm. in the next.